MSNBC anchorman Brian Williams has launched an on-air attack against fake news. <laughs> These little satires crack me up. They're so funny. Oh, wait, this really happened. Williams told his audience that he has done extensive reporting on the fake news issue while heading an MSNBC investigative team made up of an explosives expert, a black computer hacker, a midget acrobat, and an alluring femme fatale. Williams says his team trailed a group of conservatives to an abandoned warehouse in the waterfront district of Gotham City. There, using the elaborate skills he acquired as a jewel thief in Monte Carlo, Williams says he managed to break into the warehouse unnoticed and hang upside down from the ceiling in one of those wire contraptions Tom Cruise used in the first Mission Impossible movie, or possibly the second. They all sort of blend together. Williams went on to tell MSNBC viewers that he witnessed a group of conservatives performing bizarre hypnosis experiments on left-wing virgins in order to convince them to seduce Russian agents of Vladimir Putin to hack into DNC computers and skew the results of the election by releasing a, quote, cheese pizza, unquote, which is dark web slang for a flat round piece of baked bread dough topped with spicy tomato sauce and melted mozzarella, which is apparently impossible for American voters to resist. Williams managed to break this story before he was kidnapped by conservative thugs and beaten to a lying sack of pulp. Another crusader against fake news is Hillary Clinton, a former something or other. I can't remember now what she did. Mrs. Clinton says fake news is being generated by the same vast right-wing conspiracy that tried to convince her her husband had been serially unfaithful with an uncountable number of young, warm, vivacious, sexually welcoming women because he couldn't stand the sight of the ice maiden he married purely for political purposes. Mrs. Clinton says she discovered this fake news conspiracy after flying into Bosnia under sniper fire where she found a video maker manufacturing anti-Islam YouTube videos that caused a riot to erupt in Benghazi, Libya, leaving four Americans dead through absolutely no fault of hers or President Obama's. Mrs. Clinton said she would be as diligent in exposing fake news stories as she had been in releasing the government emails that somehow found their way into her private server along with the 57,000 emails about yoga, which you don't need to see, so she deleted them, then washed out the inside of her computer with acid and then killed anyone who might have read them previously. Former something or other Clinton said she would continue her fight against fake news in her new position as the feminist conscience of the nation, a position conferred upon her by an international gathering of the most powerful op-ed writers at the New York Times. Like Mrs. Clinton, the New York Times also used to be something, but I can't remember now what it was. Trigger warning, I'm Andrew Claven, and this is The Andrew Claven Show. I feel hunky-dunky, life is tickety-boo. Birds are winging, also singing, hunky dunky dee doo Ship shaped, dipsy topsy, the world is a bitty zing. It's a wonderful day, hurrah, hooray! It makes me want to sing. Oh, hurrah, hooray! Oh, hooray, hurrah! What is a poor satirist to do when Brian Williams goes on TV and says, all right, the answer, oh, wait, what happened? You just, there it is. This is uh, our, our, our what, what is your job here, Austin? You sit there every day. What, what, I make cool stuff. He makes cool stuff. And one of the cool stuff is the 12 days of the Andrew Clavin show uh, on Christmas where we have... I see we have the French hen. She's wearing a French maid outfit. I don't want to talk to you about Austin's private life. We have a, call, a calling bird with a cell phone. And what, what is this, the five rings? Is that the Olympics? <laughs> I've got golden rings, of course. That's right. All right. We have, uh, we're going to talk about the Russians. Uh, we're going to have our Golden Globe winning cultural correspondent, Michael Knowles, is going to come on. Uh, I do want to say, first, just over the weekend, over the uh, Clavenless weekend, the my memoir, The Great Good Thing, a, cult, a, cult, a secular Jew comes to, to faith in Christ, The Great Good Thing, was named by two different people as their books of the year. Uh, both, uh, yeah, in the Wall Street Journal, they asked all these famous people who, uh, what books they liked, and Mike Duran, the accomplished historian, I think he's from the Hudson Institute, he named The Great Good Thing, went on at length about it, which was very nice. And John Lewis, uh, Christianity Today, a very good uh, book critic in Christianity Today, put me on his top list of the year. You can get that book, and while you're there, you can pick up my novel, Werewolf Cop, for only a buck ninety-nine on Kindle, 
if you live in the United States. Some people have been complaining that they're not in the United States, but if you're not in the United States, you should complain. All right, before we talk about anything else, <laughs> I want to talk about, I have to talk about John Glenn. This was the, the worst thing about the Clavin this weekend was the death of John Glenn. I mean, it was 95, it was time, but that's, that's another thing altogether. Normally, you go into the top news of the day and you get to these things last, but John Glenn was so important, uh, certainly in my life and in the cultural imagination of my generation, that I thought I just, I just had to mention one thing about him. When I was a kid, John Glenn, obviously, the great astronaut, one of the first of the, one of the Mercury Seven, he was the first man, the fifth man in space and the first man to orbit the Earth. Here is the famous, here, play the famous moment when he took off. This is the famous moment at Cape Canaveral, I guess. Our latest check, pressurization, oh. rocks tanking. Have a blinking high level light. You are go. Water systems, go. Range operations, mercury capsule, go. All pre start panel lights are correct. The ready light is on. Eject mercury umbilical. Oil evacuate. Mercury umbilical clear. Mercury is evacuate. Go. Lights on. All recorders to fast. T minus 18 seconds and counting engine start. May the wee ones be with you, Thomas. Good Lord, ride all the way. Godspeed, John Glenn. Just a really moving moment. Um, he, he, Glenn joked that he was sitting on millions of dollars of equipment made by the lowest bidder. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he, he was he, he was a uh, combat. He flew over a hundred combat missions in World War II and Korea. Won the Distinguished Flying Cross six times. He was a U.S. senator, obviously, and then the oldest man in space when he went back up uh, on the shuttle in 1998. When I was a kid. And that, that, when that was being played, I was eight years old. When I was a kid, there were three men who represented what an American man was to me, which was very important because if you read my memoir, you'll see I didn't have a lot of male role models that I could appreciate, and I needed uh, people to guide me. I looked in literature, and I obviously looked in uh, pop culture. And the three were Mickey Mantle, who was the center, great center fielder for the New York Yankees, uh, John F. Kennedy, who was the president, so we all admired him enormously, and John Glenn, who was the hero of the age. I mean, he was just, you know, beyond imagining. It's, it's, it's impossible to describe what a great hero he was. And, of course, as I got older and uh, the news media started to tell more of the truth about people's lives, it turned out that both JFK and Mickey Mantle were not what they were cut out to be. I mean, JFK was a philanderer and a very, very sinister, in some ways, politician. I'm not saying he was the worst president ever. He wasn't. That he's the worst president ever. Is about to leave office. But JFK was, you know, he was not a good guy. He was not a good person. And uh, and certainly Mickey Mantle, who probably was a nice person, was a terrible drunk. Uh, he said very movingly before he died when he came down with liver cancer. He said, you talk about being a role model, I'm a role model, don't do what I did. I mean, so he was, so these were, John Glenn was who he seemed to be. And that doesn't mean he was perfect, you know, the press likes to make us think that if a guy isn't perfect, he's terrible, you know, it's, it has nothing to do with being perfect, but he was a great hero. If you read uh, Tom Wolfe's The Right Stuff, he was the epitome of the right stuff, a guy whose heartbeat didn't even speed up when he was launched into space. He was uh, married to the woman he met in his crib, virtually. I think she was two years old when he married Annie. My favorite story about him is that Annie had famously had this terrible, terrible stutter. She could barely speak. And when Lyndon Johnson, then the vice president, wanted to meet with her in front of the camera, she panicked. She said she couldn't do it. And John Glenn basically told the, the vice president to get stuffed. He said, like, he said, they aren't, if, he said, Annie, if you don't want the vice president in, in your house, he is not coming in the house. And uh, the story that I just love about her, uh, it, it was apparently one of the great marriages. And she in the 70s, I think maybe the 80s, they developed a new technique for improving stutters. And she went into this program, and she came back, and she was able to speak better. And she said, she said to John Glenn, there's something I've been wanting to tell you for years. Pick up your socks. And <laughs> I always thought, I thought that was, if my wife was kept silent for years, that would be the first thing she said to me, too. Anyway, a great hero. When here, you know, when people are what they seem to be, when heroes are what they seem to be, you would think that people would love this, but they don't. Uh, you know, one of the reasons I saw John Glenn uh, in person when he was running for president and he was boring, you know, he was not like, because he was a, a real person. People want to know that their heroes have feet of clay. They would much rather adore and worship some rock star slag because she doesn't hold them up to any standard higher than their own. They would, next time they get drunk and wake up with somebody that they don't know, they can say, well, you know, Madonna does it, so it's okay with me. When you have a 
real hero like George Washington or John Glenn, and they really live up to those things. It basically says to you, you can be better. And nobody wants to hear that. And nobody wants to hear that they can actually be who they pretend they are. They would much rather be who they you know, can laugh about with their friends and, and while they destroy their uh, and other people's lives. Great, but great men uh, call us to a new level. John Glenn did that. Godspeed, Glenn, John Glenn. I was sorry to see him go. All right. The Democrat National Committee has released their newest assessment of why Hillary uh, Clinton lost to Donald Trump. Here it is. I ran out of gas. I had a flat tire. I, I didn't have enough money for cab fare. My tux didn't come back from the cleaners. An old friend came in from out of town. Someone stole my car. There was an earthquake. A terrible flood. Locust. It wasn't my fault, I swear to God. <laughs> <laughs> Locus, it wasn't my fault. This is insane, you know. This is it's it's Comey's fault from the FBI. It's this. It's that's the Electoral College. So now there's this new story from it started in the Washington Post. The New York Times echoes it today. The CIA, which had already now you got to be care you have to understand what this story is. The CIA, which had already reported to Obama and senators and other people that the Russians had hacked, had had some role in hacking the DNC and releasing all these emails that made uh, John Podesta and the Clinton campaign look bad because of the, they were bad, that they now, a, an anonymous source is telling the Washington Post, an anonymous intelligence source is telling the Washington Post and the New York Times that Putin's aim, the Russians' aim in this was getting Donald Trump elected. This story is crap. This story is 100% crap. Now, I don't even know. I'm, I'm sure it's true. I'm sure some senior official did say this, but who cares? I mean, it is a story. It was definitely a story when they said, we think the Russians are hacking the DNC and trying to mess with the uh, American elections. That an anonymous source will not come forward, but says, we now know what their motive was. How the hell do they know what their motive was? Plus, plus, the New York Times reports that this anonymous source tells them that the RNC was also hacked, but they didn't release that information, whereas the RNC says we had the FBI in here to ex explore our computers, and they were not hacked at all, so the source is already questionable. This story is crap. One of the things I think they're aiming at, is I really do think that they're aiming a little bit at the Electoral College, hoping some of these electors are faithless electors, which, by the way, would Put the, send the country up in smoke <laughs> if this, somehow the Electoral College turned this election around and they thought if they think that Hillary Clinton is going to be installed by a deus ex machina, that's not going to happen. Now listen, again, it's, it's important if the Russians are hacking computers. We want to know about it. I'm not saying that. But this story, this particular story is crap. And I have to say, and of course, the, first let's take it from the Democratic talking points of view. The Democrats are calling for an investigation. Claire McCaskill was the spokeswoman. This should be not only about protecting us going forward, but this is a form of warfare. Uh, for Vladimir Putin, who is a thug and a bully and has the friends around the globe that we don't want to be friends with, for him to be trying to impact our elections, uh, that we have to, there has to be, he has to be held accountable. And How? that's why this has to, well, that's, that's, some of that's classified, I believe. And I don't think it's something that we can discuss on TV, but I've had briefings just this last week that indicate that this is a very serious issue for the American people to understand and for Donald Trump to dismiss out of hand the intelligence community's fact gathering is frankly um, doesn't bode well for him protecting our country. I think he needs to not immediately react and wait until he gets all the facts. So <laughs> The irony here is endless. I, I, I want to say, of course, John McCain and Lindsey Graham, the two most useful idiots in the Senate, you know, the Democrat useful idiots, immediately said, yes, we need a bipartisan investigation of the, you know, it's like they're just walking into this thing. And of course, you have to investigate, again, the Russian involvement. But, you know, the idea of the Democrats who have been cozying up, they've been, they have been run blind. Vladimir Putin has run circles around Barack Obama. He has made him look like a child. Let's not go back to the Russian. We don't even have to talk about the Russian reset or remember Obama getting caught on the hot mic saying, tell Vladimir I'll have more flexibility after I, I get reelected and all this stuff. You know, 
it, and, and all of the, first of all, and the other thing is the CIA is basically accusing the Russians of doing the media's job for them. They're accusing them of getting the news that the media wouldn't get. But, you know, the other thing is the sudden confidence in our CIA and our intelligence service who are the ones, as, as Trump was quick to point out, who are the ones who told us that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, these, these are also, here's, here's the Wall Street Journal. Let me read just one quick paragraph from the Wall Street Journal. If the CIA really does have high confidence about Mr. Putin's motives, how they would know that, I don't know. But this would also be the first time in recent history. These are the same seers who missed the Russian invasion of Crimea, missed the incursion into southern Ukraine, and missed Mr. Putin's foray into Syria. The intelligence community also claimed high confidence in 2008 for its judgment that Iran had suspended its nuclear weapons program. That judgment conveniently shut down any further Bush administration action against Iran. But a year later in the Obama administration, our highly confident spooks disclosed Iran's secret force underground facility. So, I mean, you know, it's like they, what they do, what they do with Trump now, well, let's, let's listen to Trump's reaction. Trump just blew this off in a very refreshing way, as far as I'm concerned. I think it's ridiculous. I think it's just another excuse. Uh, I don't believe it. Uh, I, I don't know why. And uh, I think it's just, uh, you know, they talked about uh, all sorts of things. Every week, it's another excuse. We had a massive landslide victory, as you know, in the Electoral College. I guess the final numbers are now at 306, and she, you know, down to a very low number. Uh, no, I don't believe that at all. You say you don't know why. Do you think that the CIA is trying to overturn the results no, of the election or somehow to, to weaken you in office? Well, if you look at the story and you take a look at what they said, uh, there's great confusion. Nobody really knows. And hacking is very interesting. Once they hack, if you don't catch them in the act, you're not going to catch them. They have no idea if it's Russia or China or somebody. It could be somebody sitting in a bed someplace. <laughs> All right. Is he getting oranger? He looks like he's getting actually oranger to me. All right. We got to say goodbye to Facebook and YouTube. But, but our Golden Globe winning cultural correspondent Michael Knowles is coming on. So you might want to come over to the Daily Wire and listen to the rest. If you subscribe, you can watch the whole thing on the website, which is a joy untold. Plus, you can be in our mailbag. So come on over.